Hello, AP Calc BC students. Welcome to our first video that covers topic 9.6. This is where we wrap up all of our discussion about parametric and vectors. And to be honest, really provide you with the most commonly encountered questions that you'd see on the AP Calc exam uh, in May. So we're gonna take a look at velocity, acceleration, and speed, VA and speed of a vector value function. So let's take a look at this example. So to start off, we have um, a statement about some true facts dealing with the way that we approach calculus early on. You know, we spent a great deal of time in AB talking about straight line motion, rectilinear motion, motion uh, along the x-axis. And those equations are given to you as s of t equal, etc. And you have those questions in AB. You may have, uh, if you've taken the AP Calc AB exam, it's likely that you could have seen those on practice exams, maybe on the actual AP exam. But now we can start talking about motion along curved paths, which is a lot more realistic because everything just doesn't move in a straight line. So as an object moves along a curve in a path, the coordinates x, y of its center of mass are each functions of time. And it doesn't matter what kind of uh, an object that's moving. It could be a ball. It could be this Carmax tube, right? The center of mass would be just directly in the middle of this. It could be maybe my phone that's just moving along some curve and we just focus on the point that would be the center of mass and it always has some kind of a coordinate x comma y at some time t boy that sounds very parametric right very vectorish well rather than using f and g to put in front of like our i and j components we're just going to use x of t and y of t because that's what they stand for the component in front of i is x the component in front of j is y and i've referred to that many times the x component and y component so that you're used to it nice thing about doing this that it's very easy to use derivatives of the vector value functions uh, that we learned in topic 9.5 uh, four in order to find the object's velocity and acceleration. Remember, velocity and acceleration. Cannot emphasize this enough. Velocity and acceleration are both vectors. So they have magnitude and direction. Here's our definition of velocity and acceleration. Just what you would think. Here's our vector value function that I just described, right? r is equal to xi and plus yi. The velocity is just the derivative of that. So you take the derivative of your x component and your y component, keep the i and j in, or you can use the bracket notation. That's always OK, even with particle motion. The acceleration, and exactly what you think, it's the second derivative. And then the speed, well, the speed is the magnitude of the velocity, which is just the square root of the sum of the squares of the derivative of x and y, as you see here. The square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared. Now note, speed is not a vector. It's a scalar quantity, so you don't see the i's and j's hanging around this guy anymore. So you're going to be doing a lot of problems that revolve around these ideas, not just in this video, but a few others as well. And each one's got a little bit of a different twist so that you don't feel like you're watching the same thing over again. So here we go. Let's take a look at example one. A particle moves along a plane curve described by r of t equal 3 sine of t over 2i plus 3 cosine of t over 2 times j. For part a, let's generate a rectangular equation that describes the particle's motion. Well, this might seem familiar. We've been here before. We were doing problems like this at the very beginning stages of our parametric uh, discussion in topic 9.1. And what we discovered, whenever you had both sine and cosine as, uh, <coughs> uh, excuse me, as values of your parametric equations or in your vector function here, we're going to want to set the first one equal to x and the second one equal to y. Well, that seems very logical because that's what we just explained that these were. These were functions of t, one is equal to x, one is equal to y. But what we want to do next is very important. We are going to want to isolate the trig word. And notice the trig words aren't completely isolated by themselves yet. We're going to have to divide by 3 for both sides. So once we do that, x over 3 would be equal to the sine of t over 2. 
And if we do that again over here, y over 3 would be equal to the cosine of t over 2. Okay, well, what's up with that? What are we going to do at this point? Well, if we square both sides, and think about the motivation behind this. Why on earth would you want to square both sides? What does having a sine squared and a cosine squared mean? Ah, if we add them together, we get 1. And that's where this is headed, you guys. So once you square both sides of each equation, you're going to look at something like this. And you're going to be looking at something like this. We know, I think this is supposed to be a 2. I apologize for that. If you panicked a little bit, say, what's this guy writing? That's t over 2. Sorry about that. Once we see that the two right sides would add together to make 1, that essentially means that the left sides can add together, and they would also give you a result of 1. And that at this point, you could multiply through by a 9 and get a much more recognizable equation. And that would be the equation of a circle. Now, I'm not going to do this for the purpose of this video, but if you were so inclined and you wanted to do this, you could simply grab your graphing calculator, put it into parametric graphing mode, and you can sketch each of these two expressions as the x and the y equal. And I will bet you anything that you're going to have a circle centered at 0 zero with a radius of three. All right. Now, if we move on to part B, this is where a little bit more of the calculus comes into play. Find the vector, uh, the velocity vector, the acceleration vector, and the speed. And they ask that you interpret the speed. We'll, we'll at least discuss what the speed means. So what we're going to do with this particular problem is we're going to find our velocity, and it is a vector. And I can do that by simply taking the derivative of our position vector. So this is just old hat like we've been doing before. The derivative of 3 sine of t over 2 with respect to t. We're still going to have a 3. The sine's going to turn into a cosine of, of course, t over 2. But then the chain rule applies. The derivative of t over 2 is a half. And that half would be multiplied by the 3. So we would actually have a 3 halves in front. And then we can go ahead and throw this together with our i. And then we do the same thing over here. The derivative of 3 cosine of t over 2 is 3 halves sine of t over 2. But because the answer is negative, because the derivative of cosine is negative sine, we can just put a minus there. You could also say plus negative, and that would have the same meaning. So now. We're done with our velocity vector. We move on to our acceleration vector. So you're just getting a little bit of, of work with your derivatives. The derivative of 3 halves cosine t over 2, well, the cosine is going to turn into a minus sine of our t over 2, of course. And then the 3 halves is going to be joined by another 1 half because the derivative of t over 2 is a half. 3 halves times a half is 3 fourths. That's paired up with our i. And then for our j component, we have, as you can probably guess, a 3 fourths. And then remember, the derivative of sine is cosine. There is no sine change, no S-I-G-N change happening there uh, because of the sine derivative being uh, the same uh, positive. So in this particular case, again, I could put a, a minus here. I could put a plus a negative if that makes it a little bit easier. I will tell you that my solution key to the notes posted online have the plus negative. Now, in this particular instance, speed comes into play next. So the speed is defined as a scalar quantity. It's a numerical value as defined as the square root of the sum of the squares of the components of your original function's derivative. It's a lot of words, isn't it? Well, if we're thinking about taking the derivatives of these components, look no farther than down here, because we've already taken those. So I'm not going to jump the gun and, and do too much with them yet. Let's go ahead and take those two guys as such, 
put them in parentheses and you can see that I'm going to square the first one. And then as far as this minus is concerned, what you could do is let it tag along with that other function. And so you have negative 3 halves times the sine of t over 2 quantity squared. But when you really look at things, I don't think it matters whether you forgot this negative or, or not because of the fact that it's going to go away when we square. However, you don't want to write incorrect mathematics. Maybe this, this part here might be scored. And if you have something that's not correct, you could sacrifice points. So that would be the unsimplified speed. If we want to continue to do the speed um, a little bit more simplified, which we might need to if we have any chance at interpreting it, we would find out that we have the square root of 9 fourths cosine squared of t over 2 plus 9 fourths sine squared of t over 2. Okay, well, I get that. Now, where are we going from here? The cosine squared of t over 2 plus the sine squared of t over 2 will be left over as soon as you factor out the 9 fourths. Now, in order to save us some time, instead of writing out the cosine squared of t over 2 plus the sine squared of t over 2, isn't all that just going to become 1 because of the Pythagorean identity? And therefore, we end up with 3 halves. And that would be our speed. Now, as far as the interpretation of the speed, what I'm looking for here is that the fact that the speed is constant. And I know that this interpretation is kind of vague. It's like, what exactly do they want here? But and if I could spell constant, it, things would be great, wouldn't it? Speed is a constant. <laughs> the speed is constant. Speed's always going to be 3 halves, whatever the units are. And I want you to know that that's not always going to be the case. We had a very good chance in this problem of having a speed that still has a value of 2, or a value of t in it, sorry. Now, I said a moment ago that the speed's going to be a scalar quantity. Well, yeah, it would be if you plugged in a certain time. I'll tell you what the, the speed is, just give me a time. Give me t equal 2, give me t equal 5. In this case, no matter what t you plug in, you're only going to get 3 halves. So that's what we're looking for there. And it's not always the case. It seems to be the case when you're just moving around this lazy little circle, and that's what we had, right? This lazy circle with a radius of 3 and a center of 0, 0. It's just going to have that nice speed all the way throughout. Other shapes won't necessarily do that. Hopefully this helps a little bit. Lots of more fun things coming your way in some future videos. Be sure to check them out. And as always, thanks for joining.